We're waiting for our third panelist. She's uh, stuck in traffic and should be here shortly. Um, we have, uh, hopefully, <laughs> when she arrives, three speakers. Um, the first uh, is Kinda Mohammadia. Kinda is an uh, expert in macroeconomic policies in the Arab world. She's senior policy advisor to the Arab NGO uh, Network for Development based in Beirut. It is a network including NGOs and CSOs in 11 countries in the MENA, focusing on development issues. Um, she's currently based at the South Center in Geneva, where she is researching investment policies and treaties, um, including a comparative analysis of IMF agreements in Morocco, Tunisia, uh, Egypt, Jordan, and Yemen. And she's also focusing on trade agreements um, between the EU and GCC and the Arab world. She holds an LLM in International and European Economic Law and a master's degree from the University of California, uh, Los Angeles uh, in Public Affairs. Um, Yes, so, and then uh, um, our second panelist who um, will be arriving shortly is Mahinor El Badrawi. She's a researcher at the Egyptian Center for Economic and Social Rights. It is a new uh, organization dedicated to research, litigation, and advocacy organization around economic and social rights. It was founded by Khalid Ali. Uh, the former Egyptian presidential candidate in the 2012 race, um, the youngest candidate who is focusing on social justice issues. Um, Mahinor leads the center's International Financial Institutions Monitoring and Foreign Debt Unit and has done, conducted quite a bit of research on um, the Freedom and Justice Party's economic platform or proposed one and the IMF negotiations. Faisal Atani is a visiting fellow with the Rafi Kariri Center for the Middle East. He is uh, an analyst focusing on economic development and political economy in the Arab world. Uh, before joining the Atlantic Council, he worked as a political and economic risk analyst, advising governments, corporations, and international organizations on regional developments. He holds an MA in International Economics and Strategic Studies from the John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies um, and a Certificate in Public Policy from Georgetown University and a BA in Business from the American University of Beirut. Um, Kinda is going to start us off with some comments on the current economic challenges in the region and IMF engagements. Uh, Mahinor will focus on Egypt and the IMF negotiations. And then Faisal will help uh, draw us out to the broader themes and issues um, facing um, the political and economic intersections and the reforms going on in the current post-revolution climate in the region. Um, focusing on Jordan and Egypt as, as examples, but again, um, helping t us to, to look broadly at, at how politics interact with these issues. So, um, and then we will open for question and answers. Kinda? Good morning, and thank you, Leila, for hosting this discussion. Yeah, um, I think I want to... Uh, Mike? I need my... Um, we have... The mic needs to be turned on. I think just wait a few minutes because okay. we're getting Mahinor um, uh, mic'd. But, but I just want to add actually at this point that um, we did invite someone from the IMF to join the panel, um, but the IMF was unable to send someone at short notice. Um, Kinda and Mahinor as a delegation from the region, a civil society delegation has met with the IMF and uh, it's been engaged this past week in the IMF World Bank meetings. So um, perhaps, Kinda, in the question and answer, we can also discuss a bit about you know, what you've dis heard from them on, on the issues sure. that you'll raise. Sure. So uh, Mike, 
uh, Kinda's mic needs to be unmuted. Is it ready? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Good morning. Sorry. Don't worry. Welcome, Mahina. So, uh, w as um, as Leila have introduced the Arab NGO Network for Development, where I am in engaged, is a platform of civil society organizations uh, from 11 Arab countries. The, uh, our office is based in Beirut, but we work on uh, economic and social policies and rights across the Arab region. So one of the uh, major uh, issues we focus on is to try to understand the economic uh, problematic that have underpinned the uh, revolutions and people's uprisings that we have seen since uh, 2011. And what I would like to do in the few uh, minutes uh, I have uh, as an introduction today is to try to highlight our diagnosis of this problematic and what it means for our way uh, forward. Because definitely we see that there is no uh, uh, chance for a sustainability of economic practice in the, uh, I mean democratic practice in the Arab uh, region without putting at the center of this uh, process uh, economic and social justice and redressing uh, uh, inequalities that underpin the economic model that have been uh, established during the last two decades. So in this regard, if you look back two to three decades in terms of the major economic trends across different Arab countries in the region, and I want to uh, highlight that definitely there are differences between the countries of the region, for sure. Not only between the Gulf uh, uh, countries and the oil exporting countries and the others, but also across the other middle income uh, countries. But still you can see certain trends which uh, have cut across uh, uh, different different uh, big economies in the region. One of the major trends is the regress in the productive capacities in the Arab region, specifically the decline in the manufacturing capacities and in the contribution of the agricultural sector. And a, a shift towards the uh, low uh, added value uh, services uh, sector. This have been associated with also a period where we have seen s a certain level of economic growth achieved in, uh, uh, in the region around uh, 5 to 6 percent in uh, many years, but also along with that there was a decline in uh, job generation capacities and decent job generation capacities that were able to absorb the uh, uh, skilled labor in the region. And also there was a, a, a regress in uh, uh, wages, uh, the depression of wages as a percentage of national income. This we see reflects and underpins the economic and social violations in the previous decades in the region because it is uh, in a way uh, reflecting how the citizen was marginalized and uh, as an economic player and as a contributor to the growth cycle in the uh, Arab region. So these, you have seen, uh, like manufacturing capacities, you have seen significant, consistent uh, regressive trends in Egypt, in Morocco, in Tunisia. So these are not uh, only country uh, specific. In the same time, you can see that uh, the investments in the region and uh, uh, their allocation have been over concentrated in sectors that are uh, low in, uh, in terms of uh, employment generation. You can see that between 2003 and 2010, two thirds of the investments attracted in the region and and here we w we need to say that compared to other developing regions the arab region was not high in terms of attracting investment, but the investments that were attracted were concentrated in the real estate and the mining sector. So this also is another uh, uh, trend that we, uh, we focus on. So overall, you can see that there has been a trend where uh, uh, productive uh, projects and uh, developmental projects in general were marginalized. And you have seen the economy being organized around a macroeconomic framework that prioritized an expedited process of trade liberalization, investment liberalization and deregulation, privatization, dismantling of state-owned enterprises, and uh, uh, borrowing. 
So borrowing thus associated with an increase of uh, the debt carried by these countries. And this is why today we see countries like Egypt uh, uh, allocating more than 25% of their uh, uh, national incomes to debt servicing. This is significant in terms of shifting the uh, priority of allocation of national funds from the national citizen challenges and developmental challenges, whether they are education, whether they are wages, whether they are health, to paying a debt which not necessarily was allocated or borrowed based on a transparent citizenship led citizen led uh, process which served the uh, citizen who is now paying for that from their taxes so this this uh, um, trends, these trends we see are core to our understanding of what led us to see people uh, uprising in the region. And thus, it should be central to our understanding and design of the ways forward. So in that term, we uh, are very cautious when we hear that uh, now the main challenge in the region is stabilization of the economies to, uh, uh, based on a model that was uh, uh, established before the revolution. Why? Because we uh, do not see that stabilization it should be only focused about stabilizing the uh, balance of payment uh, uh, situation of these countries, their uh, debt uh, servicing situation, or their uh, uh, inflation uh, levels, for example. We see the stabilization of the, these economies in a much more broader a sense, we see it as a challenge to stabilize the real economy in these uh, uh, countries, meaning the reverse in the declining trends in the productive capacities and stabilizing uh, and, uh, the advancement of productive capacities, stabilizing the employment generation capacities in these countries. So we see a much broader understanding of how these uh, economies should be revived and stabilized uh, compared to the notion of stabilization that we hear from international financial institutions and uh, uh, other uh, international organizations being uh, involved in, uh, in the region. So this was one of the main things that we were trying to highlight in our discussions that Leila uh, 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 alluded to with IMF staff, but also with other civil society organizations and uh, uh, policy uh, 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 activists and policy persons who work in DC on foreign, uh, uh, foreign policy towards the Middle East and on engagement with the developmental question in the, uh, in the Arab countries. So overall, this is what we see as uh, the main challenge. And for us, we see that uh, the interventions of international financial institutions as currently designed, they carry with them significant uh, uh, threats to the policy space of governments in the region. And when we talk about governance, uh, governments, we talk uh, with a longer term perspective based on a democratic process where governments will have to turn over. And thus, we need to uh, 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 protect and safeguard the policy space of current and future governments to use policy tools they have, including economic policy tools like macroeconomic policies, fiscal and monetary taxation policies, trade and investment in a way that contributes to reversing these trends that I have uh, uh, tried to uh, describe. And this is why we were uh, in our comparative analysis, for example, on the IMF loans uh, uh, either now being implemented in the region or the IMF loan agreements that are being negotiated with Tunisia and Egypt, we try to unpack where the kind of conditionality that associate, that is associated with these loans would contradict with our quest to safeguard the policy space for governments in the region. So I will leave it at this, and maybe we can go in more details in the question and answer. Thanks. Mahino, before you arrived, I introduced your background. So um, if you can tell us a little bit about uh, reflecting on what Kinda said, how does that play out in Egypt in terms of the specifics of the economy? Great, okay. So, um, 
So we do take on uh, the, the Egyptian Center for Economic and Social Rights, the question of uh, the IMF and the IMF uh, economic reform policies that come with any loan. We do take this on from an economic and social rights perspective because uh, of, of the evident um, interplay of the, the proposed uh, reforms to the, the, the lives of every uh, Egyptian citizen, to the average Egyptian citizen. So I will just start by out outlining the story of when the IMF came to, uh, to Egypt and what sort of uh, proposed economic reforms that were, uh, will, were brought on. Then we'll move on to what are they, how or how they are implied today in the, uh, in the actual um, policy and economic and social policy of the state. And uh, propose or what we call for as, as alternatives to the problems that those specific um, recommend recommended reforms are causing. So um, with Mubarak toppled in February 2011, we have an IMF team negotiating um, assistance, financial assistance, assistance to Egypt on the 26th of October of the same year. Um, they, were, they were there on a, on a visit from the 26th or the 3rd of November. And I think it was um, official uh, Lipton saying that the already um, the IMF is ready to support to, uh, to to give financial assistance to help stabilize the um, the the economies of Egypt and um, and promote for uh, structural economic reforms that would aspire or or or, or help fit into the aspirations of the people after the revolution. So it sounded. Um, very nice. And the proposed loan was up until uh, the President Morsi comes into power, a loan of $3 billion. However, after, after we had a president for uh, the um, obvious causes of having you know, stability in the country, the economic situation allows, so the loan will be increased from 3 to $4.8 billion. Um, however, Little did the uh, IMF team loan, IMF team know, or or even maybe the Egyptian government, that this loan would actually be working against the stability, the political and economic stability in the country. Um, so up until November, we we did not we had no idea as Egyptian civil society, as the average Egyptian, as to what terms of negotiations on the loan are happening. We, we just knew that, the, uh, that the, the loan has been increased. It's now 4.8 B. And, um, but we, ha we, had, we had no idea what sort of, of even um, economic plan, economic, what, what was the, the national economic plan upon which this loan is, uh, is coming onto, what sort of negotiations were happening. And we did not really know that until we actually civil society had to raise a case, a case on transparency, asking uh, in, in the higher administrative court, asking for the terms and the negotiate of, of the um, negotiations of the loan to be revealed, and asking the government to give to the public the economic uh, reform plan that it actually gave to the IMF. Uh, and we knew this from the IMF website, so this is how we know that there is actually an economic uh, national plan upon which the loan is being uh, discussed, so we asked to see it. Um, so when we, when we actually got the, uh, the, the national plan, what we found in it was something very surprising. It was very contradictory to uh, what is being sold by international financial institutions as the nature of the financing to the Arab countries in transition, that they actually fulfill the homegrown reform plans that are um, taken on by the, uh, by the governments, and that there, are, uh, there is no direct, um, so there, there, is, there, there are no direct recommendations, and this is what the, also the government was saying, that there are no recommendations by international financial institutions. It is what the government really uh, sees as the reform plan for, for the country and for the people. But um, when we looked at the, the economic plan that was released in November 2012, we found it that 
to exactly mirror the IMF recommendations that were made to the Mubarak government under the Article 4 Staff Consultation Report of the IMF. Um, and, wha and, and what the recommendations back then said is uh, that to, in order to um, increase the state revenues, there needs to be an immediate and full-fledged application of the VAT taxes. Uh, value-added taxation well, to broaden the tax base and to cut on uh, subsidies or, or uh, and resist any pressures to, to, uh, of, of public uh, spending on, uh, on subsidies and the need for subsidies reform. Um, not only this, it, it also called for the resumption of the privatization processes and encouraging PPP development models. Um, and, this is, and, and, and those are exactly the reform plans that came in, in, uh, in November and un, under which the, they, are, they are now tied with the um, IMF uh, loan to Egypt. Uh, what we find in reality is there was a lot of um, disagreement as to what those uh, policies had. So um, the reforms were supposed to take place on the average Egyptian as well as the businessman and the investor. So on subsidies, uh, on subsidies reform, there was supposed not to, it, wasn't, it was supposed to not only be lifted from the house, household gas, the butane um, gas cylinders, but also it was supposed to be lifted from heavy industries in, in a way that would um, result to a 30% increase on, 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 heavy, uh, on heavy energy use and heavy industries use of, uh, of energy. And the, the, the taxation was supposed to also be imp implemented on business transactions and on, on capital gains. But what happened in reality is that none of those took place. What actually took place was the, uh, the increase or the removal of the subsidies from the household gases that has raised to 150% from three to eight pounds. Um, and the, the tax reforms led into the removal of tax breaks or tax exemptions on basic food, on, on uh, fuel, on, uh, on flour and sugar and, and all other basic, uh, basic food products that used to have uh, tax breaks. Now, um, in line with what uh, Kinda was saying, the rationale for, what, for cancelling what was initially part of the, uh, what part of the reforms, ta well, taxing uh, capital gains, was actually not to scare away the investor. So the government came out on, on the 7th of April, with the prime minister of Egypt, to say, oh, we cannot uh, implement, uh, implement those because we don't want to scare away the investor. But what we're, actually, uh, what we're actually seeing and what we're saying also is that, well, the framework the, um, and, and the policies of investments today in Egypt, they do not live up to what people want. They do not sustain a real developmental model. Along with, with, with also the rhetoric that the government is using for the, uh, for the IMF loan, albeit those, uh, the reform policies, that of the burden of which falls largely on the average Egyptian and, and the poor, is to attract investments. That once we have uh, an IMF loan, it would be like a seal of approval, not only to other loans, but also to give uh, insurance to investors that Egypt is an economically uh, sustainable place to invest. But if we look at the, uh, the, the legislative framework for investment that was amended after the revolution exactly to allow the sorts of investments on, was actually very counterproductive. And it, f it features into the past cycle of doing away with the real economy and productive economic uh, models that Kinda was talking about. So um, SCAF, the, the Security Council of Armed Forces, issued when they, they were the, when, when it had the 
legislative power before having a president in, in the two years interim period after the revolution issued a law called law number four year 2012 and what it does is that it gives immunity to investor from undergoing or from going into any court process processes when there are um, uh, suspicions or uh, of uh, or disputes on uh, on corruption or or, or or money or or so forth and instead of going into court uh, the investor shall go into a reconciliation committee within the respective um, within the respective ministry with which he or, or, or had the initial contract the initial investment contract Mo lo lots of the times when it comes to investing with the government, the, the type of PPP that is being now pushed forward as a, as a development-led model. And this is very problematic, not only because it attracts the, diff the, the, the wrong type of investor, but it's also problematic because it's stopping the, um, the, the um, taking back of the uh, Egyptians of their wasted assets over uh, the last two decades of uh, irresponsible privatization, like, like Kinda was, was speaking about, and, and the deterioration of the, of the real economy. An example of this is that there is, so Egypt is really famous for textiles, right? Like textile industry and used to um, export a lot and so forth. So there was one, and this is just one example, a uh, factory in Mahalla, Mahalla al Kubra, and it's, it's a textile factory called Ghazl Jbin. This factory used to house 20,000 workers and it used to, to produce a very, well, used to have a very productive, um, very productive uh, businesses and, and, and work and so forth. And it was sold, it was privately, it was, it was sold to a private investor, it was privatized. Uh, in a, uh, with a contract that was later on seen as a corrupt contract that devalues the, 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 re, the, the value of, of, of this um, factory. And also it has done away, I mean, the, the, the investor that bought it was, was, a, was an Indian competitor that actually done away with the, with the factory. Now it only houses two and a, two and a half uh, thousand workers and it does not pr produce anything significant, significantly close to, um, to what it used to produce before. So with this, with this corrupt, with this, with this anti-developmental policy and legislative framework in our countries, the sort of investor that will we actually be uh, calling for, what we're actually inviting, is the investor that will reproduce the cycle of weakening the um, any, any, any chance for real economic, um, for, for, for real economic development uh, for, for the people. Uh, okay, I will, I will stop here. I mean, I've been speaking for so long and maybe later on we can talk about alternatives to the IMF. If there are questions and answers. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking Leila and the New America Foundation for having me here and for all of you for attending I was telling Kinda right now that it's great to see the policy discourse moving beyond just pure security issues and political Islam to actually how these countries are going to be grown and governed. Um, I don't want to talk too much about the economic merit of this or that uh, IFI uh, proposed policy. I think the real question in the longer run is how uh, viable are these proposals in the political context of uh, the, Arab, the Arab transition countries and to to answer that, I want to explore two countries in particular. Can you just uh, talk a little bit about what proposals you're uh, No, reflecting? some of the sort of neoliberal uh, okay. uh, economic reforms, the subsidy reforms, the fiscal reforms, and privatization, yeah, and, okay. and what have you. Uh, I want to explore the cases of Egypt and Jordan, not because they're the only challenged countries, but uh, because I sometimes find case studies are especially useful, more so than generalizations, and also because Egypt and Jordan happen to be going through both things that are common across many other Arab countries economically, uh, but also because uh, they also have particular interesting political contexts that highlight the challenges of reform. Uh, and uh, through this, I hope to demonstrate how really how fiendishly difficult it is for these governments to reform their economies, but at the same time preserve a modicum of political and social stability without undoing their entire orders. 
Uh, in the case of Egypt, of course, as you've highlighted, we're aware of the serious economic crisis, the growing need for external aid, uh, and we know that the IMF has driven, uh, driven reforms uh, through uh, subsidy reforms and taxation reductions and what have you. But clearly, I think in the case of Egypt, the economic agenda is being held hostage by the political one to a large extent uh, due to a series of mistakes by the Muslim Brotherhood, but also I think due to the political culture in Egypt right now and Egypt's own experience with uh, liberalization uh, reforms through the 1990s and early 2000s. For those reasons, I think the government will actually find it very difficult to undergo the sort of meaningful developmental reforms. Firstly, because I think there's been a lot of distrust and resentment built against the Muslim Brotherhood, which tends to sort of magnify any, any political opposition to this or that particular economic policy is now tenfold because the Muslim Brotherhood is proposing it. Uh, I think there are also electoral considerations at play. Uh, it seems like the Brotherhood, is, uh, the government in general, has been trying to push, to postpone these difficult reforms until October, uh, which of course is when parliamentary elections are in Egypt are scheduled. Uh, I spoke very briefly about the bad experience of Egypt with liberalization in the 1990s and early 2000s. And I realize this is a qualified liberalization, but nonetheless, this is what the perception of it is amongst the public. And finally, I, I, I want to say something critical about the way the Brotherhood has handled this, which is that uh, their own behavior has fostered a sort of disillusionment with the political process in Egypt, and I think sort of poisoned the, the policy discourse there. Uh, and uh, of course, it, uh, what's happening is the opposition has been opposing these reforms for political reasons, which is obviously not unique to Egypt. That's a worldwide phenomenon. But opposing something for political reasons is one thing, and resorting so quickly to street protests, uh, violence and coercion and disruption is something else and it shows a level of distrust that's gone beyond simple opposition politics. Uh, I think it's interesting that the opposition uh, amidst these IMF negotiations accused the Muslim Brotherhood of not consulting with them when they were, uh, when they were uh, talking to the IMF. Of course, if a government has a legitimate mandate to govern, it doesn't need to consult with the opposition before it uh, for crafts an economic reform program. But I think this shows not only that this or that policy may not be valid, but actually that people don't think that the government has a right to make these decisions on their behalf to begin with, uh, which is a bit more problematic. Uh, so in light of this, it looks like the, these, these reforms are going to be put off uh, as long as they can, as long as there is external Arab financial support that will help Egypt go through this sort of temporary phase until elections decide the political balance. Uh, the case of Jordan is a bit different. Uh, Jordan has been faced with a number of sort of unlucky external shocks that have combined with its own political structures to make things very difficult for the monarchy. Uh, the reforms at play here are some of the same ones seen in Egypt, uh, tax reforms, uh, subsidy reforms, the liberalization of trade, as well as a sort of push for transparency and anti-corruption, which has been a very I mean, certainly not consistently applied in the case of Jordan. But also the economy is vulnerable in a different way than Egypt's. And partly this is because of Jordan's heavy dependence on financial aid externally. Also it's heavy dependence on imports from Egypt which have been, which have been disrupted. I'm talking about energy imports in particular. And finally, of course, there's the crisis in Syria which has uh, displaced hundreds of thousands of refugees into Jordan and placed a significant financial burden on the state. But I think at the heart of Jordan's dilemma and what's so constraining about its situation is the political elite in Jordan is not, the, is not the same as the economic elite. And in fact, the two are quite hostile to one another sometimes. The economic elite tends to be drawn from uh, a middle class based on Amman, the capital, and uh, is predominantly, to a large extent actually, at least, uh, Palestinian. Of course, Jordan's population is majority Palestinian. Whereas the security forces and the political the tribal basis of the, of the regime stability is uh, the Bedouin or tribal or East Bank or population based outside the city. Uh, and uh, what they see is that these reforms that have been carried out over the past couple of decades uh, have disproportionately uh, benefited the economic Palestinian elite uh, close to the king and his, uh, and his uh, wife, Queen Rania, who also happens to be Palestinian. And uh, so this has basically undermined some of the support that the monarchy's traditionally been able to take for granted from, uh, from the tribal groups. So far, it's been aimed particularly at the king, not at the monarchy, but that could change. So by pursuing these sort of economic reforms, the monarchy risks actually destabilizing its contract, if you will, with, uh, with its own uh, base of support, and therefore the entire polity. 
late last year when uh, the government moved to lift some subsidies of basic goods, this led to a number of protests in sort of tribal hinterlands that pitted these protesters against what are Bedouin-dominated security forces, which is a very uncomfortable position for the monarchy to be in, and not sustainable, I would argue. And even relatively uncontroversial things like the pursuit of anti-corruption drives or more transparency, that would actually endanger these sort of patronage networks between the monarchy and the tribes and the economic elite and everybody, really, uh, on whom the monarchy depends. We've seen from our experience that when Arab regimes are forced to choose between difficult economic reforms uh, that would be good for the economy in the long run, arguably, uh, or uh, political reforms, uh, or, or sort of political stability, rather, in the status quo. Whenever they've been able to choose the status quo, they've done it, uh, because uh, they have to keep their policies together at the end of the day. And this is where the GCC has played a role as a sort of lender of first resort to these, uh, to these uh, states. But really, I'm just skimming very much the surface of uh, po complex political economies of these countries, just to highlight really how difficult the, the situation facing these regimes are, regardless of how critical we are of them and the IMF. And it seems to me that IFIs, in order to sort of enrich their understanding of what's going on in these countries, is they're going to have to grapple with these very complex political issues. I'm not sure they have the mandate, the resources, or the inclination to do that. Uh, perhaps rightly so, but uh, it's still an issue uh, worth highlighting. But I think the two takeaway lessons here are, first of all, uh, regardless of the merit of a policy, you can't implement economic reforms without a strong social contract and political mandate, whatever the case. Uh, and uh, second of all, that the availability of the sort of uh, very flush Gulf money uh, that displaces these sort of international support organizations or IFIs offers these regimes an easy out of sorts that uh, lets them postpone or indefinitely procrastinate these difficult economic decisions. Uh, and with that, I'll, uh, I'll leave it to uh, Leila and all of you. Okay. Yeah, I think it was an interesting way to end. I mean, there's, um, I think, you know, in, th in working on these issues a bit um, in, in the past um, three years since the revolution started, um, you know, there there is uh, we, uh, we, um, a difference between perhaps the policies being proposed by international financial institutions, for instance, the ending of, of fuel subsidies. Is that necessarily a bad, harmful uh, policy for the countries? Um, and, and are the people upset about it because of, of the actual substance of the policy? Or is it the context in which uh, these reforms would be pursued? Um, lack of transparency, lack of communication, um, you know, upset and uh, by, by those that um, have benefited from these subsidies who are said to be the elite, uh, generally speaking. Um, is it the failure of, of these governments really to put forward a platform that shows that the cost of ending the subsidies will not be absorbed by the poor? Um, and, and I would note here that the IMF has indicated in its negotiations with uh, Egypt that it wants to see fuel subsidies replaced with better targeted social protections for, for vulnerable groups. And so I would just pose the question um, to, to all of you, is it the substance of the policies that are the problem, or is it the, the environment in, in which um, they are being uh, pursued and, and have been pursued in, over the past um, decade? And now, and, I, and the second question I, I, I want to put forward to the panel is that, um, and I'm particularly to Kinda and Mahinor, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the idea that um, countries have to build their own independent economic capacities um, and, and get away from a f a dependency f on, on foreign um, investment, perhaps, or, f or foreign foreign borrowing in particular, um, but but is your isn't your um, idea and your critique more relevant to the long term, given the very um, severe financial crises that uh, Egypt and other countries are facing in terms of their huge budget deficits? I mean, aren't these loans important for staving off crisis in the 
immediate term, but looking long term, we can we can incorporate your policies or, or your 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 critiques. Well, you know, how do they relate to the immediate term? You want me to start on my Sure, please. Okay. Uh, is my uh, voice good? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what definitely, uh, I would say that the uh, challenge is a longer term challenge, for sure. But also, the uh, the challenge we are facing today is not a result of the uh, mobilizations and the revolutions of 2011 and the decline of uh, international reserves, for example, that these countries have, or that they were not able to sustain tourism, or they were not able to attract investment from 2011 today. This is not something that we witnessed after the revolution or as a result of the uh, lack of uh, security and stabilization afterwards. This is an accumulation of years and years of a deliberate design of policies in a way, of economic policies in a way that led to a decay in the ability of these economies to sustain the uh, 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 and to address the economic and developmental challenges of millions and millions of people in these countries. So this is not, this is one issue we need to take into consideration. The second issue is the intervention of international financial institutions is not of only short-term implications. These kind of loans and the uh, design of the policies and conditions that come with them have generational implications because they, uh, first of all, design the current macroeconomic policies with a very short-term vision. So they focus on inflation stabilization and balance of payment stabilization and overall austerity measures, which not necessarily allow the governments and the people today to start building the blocks for a longer term shift. So this will actually limit their ability to transition in the medium and longer term. In addition, it comes with structural policy reforms that will necessarily have longer term implications, not only short term implications, specifically when there is intervention by uh, uh, international financial institutions in advancing recommendations on trade and investment policy design uh, uh, in these countries because these are longer term uh, implications. The thir third thing we need to take into consideration is that these loans are debts that these uh, citizens and these ca countries will have to pay. Okay, this is the reality. But the question is, what are these debts being used for? Because all countries have debts. But the question and the core of the issue is, are they being used to block a hole in debt servicing? Or are they being used to design the way out of the economic decay that we have arrived at after 20, 30 years of deliberate economic policy design in a way that did not help the people of this region. So I think these are three critical questions that we need to uh, put at the center of addressing any kind of uh, uh, loan agreement. And a short answer to your question in about the uh, substance of the reforms or the way they are done, definitely the substance of the reform and the austerity nature of the reform uh, 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 being uh, proposed now is not useful specifically in a transition period and in a period where people are uh, uh, passing through a significant destabilizing uh, 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 process of their uh, uh, economic and social situation. But uh, uh, th this we need as well to take into consideration in addition to the nature of the negotiations and the transparency and the uh, engagement uh, of designing these agreements. Okay, Mahima. Can you tell us what would be the alternative then to, to respond to the very severe uh, financial crises facing a country like Egypt, okay. uh, where its foreign currency reserves are depleting and where its budget uh, deficit is skyrocketing? All right. So one, one of the alternatives is, would actually be to do a real reform, so not to actually include, uh, to, to 
uh, ignore the, 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 the reforms of that are already being proposed, taxation and subsidies, yes, but to do them on a more effective way that would put the burden on those who have more capital actually to give in order to raise uh, uh, state revenues, which are the investors and the businessmen and those who, who have more. But um, for example, so progressive uh, taxation is one of, one, of, one of the alternatives and a real progressive tax, uh, uh, taxation. So the income taxes in Egypt, how do they go now? They go so from 5 to 20,000 uh, pounds uh, income per year are taxed 10%. From 30 to 45,000 are taxed 15%. From 45 to 1 million Egyptian pounds per year taxed 20%. And 1 million up, they're, they're taxed 25%. That's it. So, we, so you see the progressive taxation actually happening on the lower income of, um, of, of, the, of the people, or the lower income citizen, and not the, the high income citizen. So wh what sort of reform says this from 1 million up the sky is the limit, and 24% is already very low, yeah? So a, 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 a real progressive and effective progressive taxation would be something. Uh, a non-fixed um, corporate tax is something else. The corporate tax now on Egypt is 25% fixed regardless to what, si the what size the corporate or the, or the enterprise is. There are no uh, breaks to medium size enterprises. They pay as much as, as, a, as a billion uh, billions dollars making uh, enterprises. Um, another, um, so those are like structural uh, alternatives. Other alternatives would actually be recovering the stolen assets of the country. And this sounds like a flirtatious, fun idea out of a revolutionary Tahrir Square. But in reality, it is real. And it is not so long term, because instead of negotiating such a reform from the, the, from the 26th of November 2011 until today, the government could have actually proceeded to recover either Mubarak's assets, which are the people's assets. This is why the people don't have money, because corrupt uh, elite have the money instead of them, because there is money. It has to either be for the people or for the, the corrupt elite. Libya has done this, for example. And Libya was in a very similar and even a more dire circumstances than, than Egypt. It did recover some of um, uh, Gaddafi's uh, family's um, assets frozen in Switzerland and why and not. And it's actually lending Egypt today. It just landed last month, landed Egypt two billion dollars. Yeah. So this is this is one thing that we could have used this time to 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 work on. But there is no political will. So a question is uh, why is there no political will and, and 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 how to mobilize it. Another alternative would be the actually the and, and this is something that the EU actually has said on the second of April's re resolution when they cancelled uh, the, their finances to Egypt. They alluded to recovery of the stolen assets. But another thing is, it would be the uh, the riches of the countries inside. So parts of the the devaluation of the state-owned assets. So let's just do away with the idea of who should be running those enterprises, state-owned enterprises. Uh, be it private or public se sector, that's fine. We don't have to adopt a certain economic ideology. But even when they're given to public sector, they're given to public sector with their real values. So the real value of those assets uh, that are now being uh, negotiated, negotiate, negotiated to a lower uh, value in reconciliations committees, they should be up uh, for their real values in court. So this is, this is something else. One one, just one example is, um, uh, a state land that was you, that was sold to a uh, Kuwaiti investor, a Kharafi uh, holding company, is worth in reconciliation eight billion dollars. This is just one example. So there are alternatives on structural reforms and also outside of that. You're saying that they they negotiated it for less than it's worth. The way it was sold, it was sold for way less. It was sold for a ridiculous price, something like 200 Egyptian pounds per fedan. Don't know how much acres is the fedan. If somebody knows in here, that would make sense. <laughs> but anyways, uh, it, it, it's very little. It's, it, it's like piastres per square meter. It's like 30 piastres per square meter for being supposedly re reclamation lands. And what's not, there are lots of details to it. But the reconciliation is for 8 billion. So the actual, uh, the actual price in outside the reconciliation process would be much more. Okay. Faisal, do you want to add comments? Yeah, I mean, not, not much. I, uh, I agree that uh, you know, uh, 
immediately imposing all these austerity measures could be destabilizing. But I think the issue for me is more that uh, uh, maybe I'm taking this for granted wrongly, but I think eventually these countries will have to open up their economies and make them more efficient. I think it'll be a painful process. Uh, I don't think it's something that can be done today. But I think that what the governments should be doing is preparing the way in order to be able to do it eventually, because uh, their other models have failed to deliver sustainable growth to their, to their populations. I think uh, their experimentation with privatization and liberalization and what have you in the 90s and 2000s was obviously distorted. I mean, uh, it's, it's not, you can't measure the merits of the policies based on their own experiment with it, because it was uh, you know, more or less cronyism, not much, uh, not much liberalization. Uh, but I think what's worrying me is not so much that they're going to pursue destabilizing economic policies, but that there doesn't seem to be any intention or recognition of their, their obligation for them to start building these social political orders, explaining to their populations why this has to be done, why it's difficult, and uh, giving people a, a sort of sense that this, this economic reform is going to be inclusive, the process will be inclusive, and will hurt everybody to a certain extent. Uh, but I think what's happening here is you've, you're seeing these very fragile, brittle political orders colliding with this very tough economic reality. And as a result, they don't have the options they would have uh, had they governed better. And this is particularly saddening with the, in, the, in the case of the Brotherhood because I mean, this is something that was built after a popular revolution. The monarchy, fair enough, that's been along for a long time. The structural deficits have been there for a long time. But uh, in Egypt, it's, it's disappointing that, uh, that uh, the, the ability to forge a political consensus is so weak. Okay. So let's open it for questions. Uh, please uh, sure. identify yourself. Yeah. Uh, There's a mic. I'm Mustan Barma from the Sun. Okay. Mustan Barma from the American uh, Chamber of Commerce in is it Egypt. On? Um, and uh, I've got a question for each of the three panelists, if, okay. if I may. Um, so, Faisal, firstly, um, uh, you were talking a bit about the external financing that's coming in from uh, some of the Egypt's neighbors, like Qatar and Libya, more recently. Um, you, do you think these countries should keep offering these, um, you know, band-aids um, to um, to Egypt and keep stringing them along until um, maybe the parliamentary elections, if they do happen in October, um, or um, you know, or is there a more pressing need for, you know, reform, you know, before then? Um, you seem to suggest that maybe the you know, we're waiting for the political mandate. So, um, you know, will that mandate come after the elections? Um, and also, I'm curious what the motives are of, um, you know, Qatar and, and Libya, and maybe you can shed some light on that. You know, personally, I don't think there's you know, any free lunch. So, um, uh, you know, maybe you can uh, help with that. And, uh, and, you know, is there a role that the, you know, the rest of the international community can play um, in that dynamic between, uh, you know, especially um, from the U.S. Is it something that can be done between um, the, you know, with the Egypt and the Gulf relations? Um, and uh, so, Mohinur, um, I was curious about your remarks about the, you know, privatizations and, um, and the, you know, it's a current, you know, I, I completely agree with you that they were, um, you know, a lot of uh, missteps taken in the privatization pro process of the 90s and, um, you know, you're feeling repercussions today. Um, uh, at the same time, I think, uh, you know, businesses, you know, you might run the risk of scaring off investors when you have court cases that are, um, you know, being resolved in a way that are asking certain companies to rehire X thousand workers. Um, you know, from the private sector's perspective, um, they were making companies more efficient and trimming down. And, you know, I agree in this, you know, in the Mahala case you gave, okay, you know, that you they effectively shut it down. So that's different. But I'm thinking of, you know, a cement company, for example, Semex, um, you know, recently they were ordered to rehire 2,000 of their 3,000 workers um, and, uh, you know, return uh, their, their cement plant to the state. So uh, maybe mm -hmm. you can touch on sort of that uh, a little bit. And, okay. uh, and lastly, uh, for for Kinder, I really um, enjoyed how you sort of set the scene, and uh, you know I agree with you as well. There've been you know decades of sort of mismanaged policies, and it's not just something that's happened over the last two years. Um, you you identified some trends in the beginning: the shift from sort of high skilled to um, low skilled um, workforce, and also investment being focused on less labor intensive um, industries. If I understood you correctly, uh, I just was curious if you had any. Um, reasons for why uh, those, uh, those trends were, were happening over time. 
Thanks. Can you uh, d give us your organizational affiliation? Yeah, the American Chamber of Commerce in Egypt. So. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, there's quite a few sure, sure, questions sure, there, sure. so yep. let's go. Uh, yeah, oh, uh, one at a time. Thanks, Spencer. Uh, to the question of uh, should this sort of support from the GCC for countries like Egypt and Jordan continue, uh, I mean, it's easy for me to say no, it shouldn't, but uh, the truth is that in Egypt, in particular, uh, it seems like the uh, political process, the political situation, and the fact that Egypt is quote unquote too big to fail, uh, has forced somebody to come in and, and plug this gap. Uh, one of which is the IFIs who are coming with their own sort of economic baggage uh, and social baggage. But the GCC countries tend to favor sort of the political status quo uh, over anything else, and not all of them. Uh, Saudi Arabia hasn't been as friendly to the Egyptians. Uh, but, uh, you know, Qatar sees a chance to exert regional influence and uh, cement its ties with the Brotherhood, which has been a regional strategy politically. Uh, certainly there's, uh, I mean, yes, they should continue it if the option is a total social and economic collapse in Egypt. Uh, should they be doing it for the reasons they're doing it and with such, in such a non-transparent and inefficient way? The truth is their motives are mostly, mostly uh, political, not economic. Uh, Qatar certainly doesn't need much from Egypt, uh, and even if they did get some investments or uh, contracts or what have you, I mean, this is not enough to inform their strategy. Uh, I think these decisions in the GCC countries are taken in a very central, very narrow way by a number of people within a family or uh, a policy elite who decide that this is, these are the people we have to support now. Uh, and you know, it's not a central bank decision, it's not a treasury decision, it's not a technocratic decision, it's a political one. Uh, so I would argue that the reasons it's being done is encouraging, is sort of creating this moral hazard uh, in Egypt. In Jordan, I think it's a bit different because I don't really see many other options for Jordan. Jordan is a, is a poor country uh, with, in a very unlucky situation uh, and uh, very few resources. Uh, so absent years of structural reform and a totally different model, I don't see that it has much choice, to be honest with you. Uh, now, there are political and sort of even security implications of Gulf support for, for Jordan, but I'm not going to go into that now. It involves this, the war in Syria and, and what have you. Uh, will the mandate in Egypt uh, arise after elections in, uh, in October or whenever they're held? Uh, I think the way it's going now, no. No, it won't. Uh, that's, uh, that's the short answer with all the negative implications that that brings. Uh, what can the U.S. do? Uh, I think the U.S. could do one of two things. Uh, either uh, exert some influence through the GCC on the process, on this sort of external financing process, in as much as they can. And they do have quite a bit of influence over the GCC countries, to be fair. Uh, and uh, sort of try to tie some of, these, some of this support to particular economic pledges of economic reforms, uh, perhaps cautious ones, but I think more importantly political ones as well. Uh, and this is where U.S. and GCC interests might not overlap as much as they usually do. Uh, and uh, other than that, of course, they can step in and provide their own financing. But, you know, that poses all sorts of questions with the, about the mandate of the IFIs and how it relates to American influence and relationships with the Brotherhood. So that has its own, uh, that has its own complications. Okay. Uh, can, do, can you respond secondly? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you for your question. Uh, what went wrong? Uh, well, in my opinion, uh, the, the, the main problem was that the economic uh, decisions were taken in a way that was not aligned with the developmental levels that these countries were, uh, were at. So what you've seen is more a trend to align with a mainstream economic uh, orthodoxy that was uh, uh, ruling the world and is still ruling the world without an assessment of what would work and what would not based on the developmental level of the productive sectors and the, the, the various developmental challenges in, in the region. So I would definitely highlight the structural adjustment policies of the 80s and 90s, which if you look at the uh, structural transformation of these economies uh, in the region during that period, you can see the, the definite uh, turning points that have underpinned the trends that I uh, 
that I uh, uh, described. So what we are saying is that uh, these countries have uh, uh, not only suffered from crony capitalism, but they actually suffered from an uh, and. Uh, um, and lack of uh, ability to align the design of a trade, investment, and finance, and other policies that plug these, these economies in the global economy, which is a necessity, but they did it in the wrong way. They did it in an expedited way that did not align with their specific needs. So you saw them losing competitiveness and not definitely uh, uh, climbing up the ladder of industrialization and competitiveness at the regional and the global level. So I think our discussion should be much more focused on the sequencing of the use of policies of trade and investment and liberalization, and not necessarily a blanket discussion on we need to liberalize more, we need to sign more investment and free trade agreements and all that. And here I would actually caution, uh, like caution against uh, uh, addressing reforms in an open way because uh, we need to see a much more nuanced uh, uh, approach that addresses the needs of the countries short and longer term. What the U.S. could do, I'm not sure U.S. conditionality on the way of the use of alternative financing at the regional level would be useful. The currently, the Gulf uh, financing is not done in the best way, but a conditionality on external financing to these countries is not the thing that we need. Actually, we need an alternative financing that gives a breathing space for these countries and this is the way forward the US can look into that uh, cancellation and here I want to highlight that Egypt's debt to the US is mostly in the wheat uh, uh, imports of uh, uh, Egypt from the US while the e Egypt was self-sufficient in wheat before structural adjustment and before the reforms of the agricultural policies and sector of the 80s. So this is significant to see that these reforms did not work for the macroeconomic uh, strengthening and stabilization of these countries uh, in, uh, in these days. Thank you. So uh, on the position of the investor and how it feels like when the investor has to come after a few months of signing a contract to actually pay more on uh, and, and more and more. Well, it's it's not what I was saying was not necessarily against private investment or or private led development. Although I have a lot of reservations on it, was it was actually on the investor buying, if, if they want to buy state-owned assets for its real value. So if the investor doesn't want to be uh, shocked a few months after his buy, then maybe he should go on with uh, an already uh, correct value contract. So, so it's unfortunate that the, that the investor has to face this, but the devaluation was already unfortunate before to the, the, the money that belongs to the people, really. The state-owned enterprises are people's uh, capital, not state, or, uh, and, and, I mean, not, not governments. And, and then you have to see it, if we come with this mentality of what belongs to the government and what belongs to people, there is, there is something to it. On the idea of, of, uh, of hiring uh, back laborers, um, and what and, and, and what sort of um, and, 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 and the the, invest, the 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 example that you have mentioned you've correctly noted another example wherein um, the the the, the were, were, were sacked and did not only affect the workers but also the production of, of a sector that in which Egypt used to have lots of revenues from export the textile but also when when it comes to um, to workers, I think it depends on what sorts of investment models and background do we adopt. Do we adopt investment for investor, investment and investments and investors, or um, investment for the people and for the specific condition of a country at a, at a given point in time? So now uh, you hear part of, of the global discourse on investments in Egypt. Um, before, but also most strongly after the revolution, is that investor investments should uh, create um, or should be should revolve around job creation. So um, when when you have this as a model, and then you have uh, in, in investments that 
do not uh, that, that have low low uh, job creation capacities or in fact not just job creation but does away with the labor that already does uh, produces something or, or or not is uh, is is something to take into consideration depends on which model and purpose of investment you have and it's also related to how you negotiate your wto uh, uh, terms in, in, in there, how much uh, protectionism do you have, how much Egyptians do you need to have in an investment invest, investment uh, package and, and what not. So I think it, 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 this, this comes from uh, the realization of the specific uh, moment uh, in time where Egypt's economy stands and what do you need to, uh, to do for a developmental state and developmental oriented investment. Okay, let's take three questions. We have one up front. Um, uh, thank you for this uh, debate. Uh, my, my, my name is Mariam Ben Abid, um, and I'm founder of the Arab Governance Institute and wrote extensively on the IMF loan in Tunisia. And uh, I'm thankful for the American, uh, New American Foundation for this debate because we didn't have any debate in Tunisia, even if we asked it for. So a New American Foundation did it. And um, well, I, would, I just would add something uh, about what you said, uh, and then um, go through the, some geopolitical uh, challenges through this loan. Can you be brief? We, yeah. we, we have 15 minutes left for discussion. All right. So um, all these measures are taken to increase, are, are, would be increasing uh, inequalities in Tunisia. And uh, about the subsidies, it's it's nine nine point two percent of p of poor people are getting you know benefits from this low uh, from these subsidies, and it's normal because eighty nine percent in Tunisia are middle class, are considered as middle class. So it will impoverish the middle class. We will create inequalities, and you know uh, the problem is that the union of labor and parties are not standing against that, and they have been sold a lemon with incre small increases in wages and like negotiation and all that. So this is the, the saddest part of the story. Now, about US, as US is the first sponsor of the IMF, US Treasury is the f f first sponsor of the IMF, I don't think US is doing good things for, for, for Tunisians, us, Tunisians and Egy Egyptians, as by the way, the same, same process that went, I mean, the same process that IMF adopted in both countries the same ways. And uh, so they, they designed the public policies and just give it to, 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 to the government who signed it. So anyways, the US Treasury is not helping Tunisians because they aspired for unemployment, which they cannot get with the austerity plan. We all know that. Any development, we cannot make it when it's austerity plan because for the same reason that we can cut spending, cutting spending, it, that means no, no jobs for a while. And um, and the U.S. Treasury, which our um, Ministry of uh, Secretary of State of Treasury met yesterday, the U.S. Secretary, uh, Secretary of State of Treasury. So uh, the U.S. Treasury is not helping the development of Tunisia. And I think there is a need to put hands on economies in Tunisia and Egypt for, for a main reason, for mainly geopolitical reasons. So when I control the economy of a country through the debt, I can control all its, you know, the military, I can, I can put my military uh, interests, economic interests, and political interests. And in Egypt, it's more complicated. There is a lot of, you know, uh, US defense is really afraid of the crisis in, in, in Swiss Canal. In Tunisia, it's, okay. you know. Thank you. So Do you have a question? So, yeah, I'm launching the debate on the geopolitical uh, aspect of these aspect of, of is agreements yeah. and relationships. Agreements. Okay. If they share, if you share my same opinion about that. Okay, thank you. Um, in, in the back, uh, very back, and then. Hi, my name is uh, Ithar al -Katetni. I'm a freelance journalist from Egypt. Um, I apologize, I came a little late, is so it maybe. Mic on? Oh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, okay, um, so maybe you've discussed this. Um, but I've been working a lot on the subsidies and the fiscal reforms that the IMF has been demanding. And I wanted to get your opinion if you think that these are realistic, considering, you know, the for fuel, for, for bread even, I worked a lot on bread. How, how realistic are these reforms if they're actually all implemented on impacting the Egyptians in the short term? And will they actually be able 
to allow Egyptians to live, considering almost half of them live either under or right above the poverty line, to actually implement them without having, you know, a kind of, the last time we had a president who tried to remove subsidies on bread, that didn't go so well. Yes, that didn't go so well. You had a very, very big riots. So would it be similar if that happened now? Okay, and up in the front here. Uh, Shadi Mukhtar from American University. Um, as Kinda, you mentioned, so these critiques and challenges to IMF policies are not new. I'm just wondering if um, there's more space opened up for the two of you to make these critiques since the Arab Spring. Are you being heard more? Um, is the human rights framework internationally more applicable? Uh, I know internally, uh, social and economic rights are, are big, but internationally it's always been marginalized. Is that changing? Is your voice being heard? Okay, thanks. Faisal, can you address the geopolitical question? Yeah, I, I, I guess uh, the short answer is that, well, yes, of, cor of course, uh, the U.S. Uh, via international financial institutions wants to ex uh, gets to exercise leverage over uh, the countries that it helps. Uh, I think the same thing applies, of course, for GCC or any other form of international support. But I guess th that's just sort of the way of the world, right? I mean, whoever's going to come in and, uh, and, and bail out these countries or cover their, uh, their debt uh, financing needs or help them push off reform for another year or two are going to have their own set of conditions. I would argue that at least with the IMF, we know what those are. And, uh, and they're available and openly debated in, in a forum and, uh, and within the government, hopefully. Uh, the GCC ones much less so, uh, but uh, you know I, I don't I don't think it's avoidable, and I don't think it's either G GCC or the IMS role to sort of develop a plan of economic growth and uh, and reform and uh, you know a, social, a new social contract for these countries. I'm not experts about these institutions, but that doesn't strike me as their mandate. They have a narrow one. Uh, they uh, provide financial assistance, and these are the things they they request be put in place in order to. They're money lenders at the end of the day, and they can't go around, you know, taking the lead on massive economic reform agendas. It's not their responsibility or their, or their expertise. This is, this is the responsibility of governments. And in this respect, these governments have failed. Uh, the monarchy, for its own reasons, many of which are historic, uh, the current Egyptian one, I would argue, from its own fault, I, I'd be less forgiving of that. Uh, but again, I, I just want to sort of bring back the discussion, just keep in mind what it is these guys are supposed to do, these organizations, and what it is they're not. That's it. But when you do, when you, when you look at the, let's say in Egypt, the tendency to, to give benefits or you know, devalue property in favor of a foreign investor, or you take a loan from the GCC, or you, in, you engage in the conditionality, it does create an imbalance uh, where the countries of the region are beholden to um, the external partners. It, 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 it reinforces a hegemonic uh, relationship of course. Between, between the West and the GCC and the, and the, rest, the Levant and North Africa. Well, something like uh, you know, privatizing state assets at ridiculously low prices is, I think, uh, just very much a part of the domestic political and economic calculus. Uh, if you have uh, the right connections and uh, you're friends with the right minister or the right minister's son or what have you, you are going to have access to these very lucrative, underpriced assets. Uh, with respect to the, the sort of geopolitical I mean, yes, no, it's, it's, it's certainly unpleasant, right, and it's worrying, but uh, these countries are, you know, weak, uh, almost broke, uh, and uh, they've been dependent on these powers for a long time, particularly in the case of Jordan, but not, not only Jordan, not, not at all. Uh, I think it's to be expected uh, that the GCC would try to exert that sort of influence, particularly as that's the only influence tool they have. Uh, they don't, they're not military powers, uh, they don't have large populations. Uh, their tool internationally and regionally is, is the purse, is money. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's to their credit when they use it to achieve uh, economic and political stability. Uh, and I guess it runs against them when they don't do that. But again, I just think, I just started arguing for a little bit of sobriety and realism when it comes to expectations from foreign powers uh, that they always come with strings attached. And that's why you need to do what you have to do to, to decrease that dependence. But in the short run, that's not an option. So. Okay. Can, do, can you address the process question? I think is very if important. If there is more uh, 
space and more uh, well for from where we sit our assessment is that uh, specifically in terms of the international financial institutions I think you were uh, asking there has been more uh, of a uh, attempt to repackage the same old uh, uh, policy prescriptions under uh, more declaratory positions that uh, link these policy prescriptions to employment, uh, talk about employment, about social uh, uh, protection, and about uh, 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 transition overall. So because in the core what we have when if we are monitoring the reports coming out from uh, uh, international financial institutions like the IMF uh, before the uh, cri uh, the global crisis 2008 after before the revolutions in the region 2010 2011 and after you have a consistent trend of similar uh, uh, macroeconomic policy recommendations and structural policy recommendations in the area of trade and investment. But you uh, also uh, see a significant lack. And here, this is one of the main questions we were trying to pose in our meetings, is that when you claim that these policy prescriptions are going to lead to more employment uh, uh, support at the longer level, you need to back them up with uh, assessments and uh, numbers. And this is not being provided by institutions like the IMF and others. It's much more shorter term assessments that they uh, provide. And also, through our monitoring, we are uh, 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 diagnosing and we are finding significant contradictions as well between the objectives that they declare, the short-term objectives like balance of payment, stabilization, and like with uh, the uh, structural uh, policy uh, advice that they give in terms of liberalization of trade and investment. And here one example in one minute, Jordan. You explained why Jordan is taking the loan now. It is external stress due to the oil prices and this oil market. In the loan agreement and in the reports that came be before and after, there is significant push for more trade liberalization with the European Union and with other countries, whereas uh, Jordan capacity to produce and export is limited. When you open your economy while you have limited capacity to export, you will fall into balance of payments problems in the medium and long term. So they, you find actually recommendations that will lead Jordan to go later on afterwards into more debt, more balance of payment stress, and thus more need for loans and support and financial assistance from the IMF. So it's a vicious circle, and we need to break it. I, I was just wondering, do you have more opportunities for meetings? Do you have more opportunities okay. to press your case and pose these challenges than you did before since the Arab Spring? Well, I don't think this is the indicator. Even if you meet, you get like smiles and statements I that I totally right. agree with you in this small room, but when I sign as a director or a deputy director of, a, uh, of a, the department uh, focusing on the region, on the report, I am not ready to put the opinion that I declare in a small room in this report. So there is no point, you know, institutionally, there is no change. You see more people, more friendly, more like listening to you. I don't think this will make the core change. We need an institutional change on the policy advice, and this is we are not seeing. Well, in Egypt, though, you have a very active opposition that has, has entered uh, positions on the issue of IMF uh, negotiations. So would you say then there is more opportunity now post-revolution to assert opinions on these issues? I don't, I mean, it might come as a reaction to a certain uh, political moment in time, but it's not, as Kinder said, institutional, and it's not, it's not real in that sense, because then none of these were happening before the subsidies reforms were actually on the ground and people were out uh, in, uh, in rage. Um, the, 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 there were no discussions when, when the IMF visited in, in, uh, in, um, in, in August, nor in November, nor in February. Okay, we'll take one more question. We did discuss quite a bit the issue of the subsidies, and uh, you had a question, Nisa. 
Hi, my name is Mahir Kayoum. I'm a political economy blogger, and I was at the World Bank IMF meetings as well. So I just wanted to get uh, two questions. Um, uh, one, this is more directed to Mahinoor. Uh, you outlined what the tax brackets were. Um, what do you see as a uh, like as a thought experiment? What what would you propose? What are the right rates uh, for the different income level groups that you described? Uh, and also based on your research, this is all for all of you, um, there's a lot of discussion on what the IMF proposed and what their intention was, but do, does any of your research look at who the players for the IMF team were? Did they have any other affiliations with um, some of the investment groups and other um, institutions that kind of have this revolving door issue? I know it's a controversial point. Uh, if, if you don't feel comfortable answering it on record, that's fine. But that I think that's something that we don't talk about a lot, that there's this criticism all the time that the IMF doesn't consider the local needs of the people. But often, sometimes the IMF teams have people from the local environment. So where does that play? Okay. So the, the tax breaks should really be broken differently. So yeah. You could either break them into two or three brackets with more uh, with more pro progressive uh, aspects on those who, who make more and less, obviously, on those who make more. Because when you say progressive tax rate, that means that the rich the more are not taxed as much as the poor. It, 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 it doesn't impact them as much. So I, if you can clarify your views of what you mean by progressive. No. Progressive. Well, what I mean by progressive is that the the more the more you make the more you pay so it goes up I don't, am I misusing yeah. the yeah. so do you tax <laughs> the rich more so than you right. yeah progresses up so right now it's not progressive That's what you're the way it's progressing up is on the those who make less of an income per year the, it progresses from I'm those who make one thousand up until one thousand proportionally yeah. right. proportionately all, yeah. all the the progressive way is on those who make lesser and from one million up there is no progressive uh, taxation whatsoever a similar debate that we're having here I think, yeah. in the u.s yes. <laughs> exactly. okay so shall we uh, do you want to um take a stab at the other question oh no let's see in terms you, you of Who's involved in the you negotiations? My curiosity. I, 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 uh, I actually know. I'm not aware that uh, that there are, that the IMF agenda itself has been compromised in Egypt uh, due to members of its delegation who are in rent-seeking positions or something of that sort. Uh, but no, I, I would actually ask you the same question, but perhaps afterwards, I'd like to know more about that because that's certainly that's certainly relevant if uh, if that's the case. Kinder, do you have any thoughts on who the IMF is engaging? I mean, I know that the, I. Conversations they've expressed that they are trying to uh, broaden their engagement to the extent that they can, although they have some institutional limitations because they're a treaty based organization. They must negotiate with states. Um, but as a NGO network, I mean, do you have an opinion on? So one of the things that we uh, we uh, say is that we understand they are treaty based they negotiate with ma uh, with the member countries but also they establish a certain policy opinion and direction on a lot of issues whether it's subsidy uh, reform whether it's structural uh, trade reform or investment reform these are opinions that are nurtured inside the institution and the institution exports through its political influence as a main uh, uh, economic and financial institution globally. So we engage with them on their staff opinion that is reflected in the reports and that staff sign on because I think confining the discussion here allows us also to uh, uh, address their policy direction and the recommendations that they advance as a policy uh, staffer. So um, it's a very challenging discussion because there's so many leeways uh, in the answers that we get from them that they can uh, isolate themselves from being held accountable to a certain position. So we are also trying to understand how to maneuver as well our uh, positions vis-a-vis -vis these responses. So it's a, it's a process. <laughs> OK. Um. Well, thanks everyone for coming out early this morning. And please feel free to approach the panelists for questions. Thank should you. you have more? Thank, Thank you. you.